Hello, writers, and welcome to Writing for Screens, writing my novel, Progress Report Number One live stream. My name is Glenn Gers. I am the guiding entity behind Writing for Screens. I am teaching screenwriting here on YouTube on this channel. Uh, I also come to you every Tuesday and Thursday, if I can make it, at 1 p.m. live Pacific Standard Time, Pacific Standard Time, um, to do live streams on various topics about writing. Um, uh, but the main thing that I do here is on this channel, these first three playlists. Screenwriting Essentials, Screenwriting Tools, Skills, and Craft, and The Process, Being a Writer. This is where I have tried to put everything I can in the most useful form I can figure out, which is short 10-minute videos, lessons that I have tried to create and present in as useful and simple and uh, handy for writers uh, that I can make it. The main thing is you've got to figure out which pieces of it are good for you and use those because every writer writes in their own way. Every project requires its own stuff and therefore you need to figure out what tools and skills and processes work for you now. And that's the main thing I want to teach you. Uh, and in order to do that, I've tried to break down some of those skills and processes into these short lessons I do recommend, beg, plead for you to take a look at those. Uh, they are free. They are available 24-7. They are the big deal I have tried to put online. Hello, Michael. Hello, Everstay. You are very welcome. Thank you for coming. Hi, Nathan. Merry Christmas coming up to you. Good evening, Morbo and Captain Tim. Nice to meet you. Hello, Najo. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. So yeah, um, today I'm going to try something new because people have asked for it because things are evolving here at Writing for Screens. Um, does titles on a screenplay need to be placed below fade in? Uh, no, you do not have to put titles into the screenplay. You can just figure they're going to put them where they want to anyway. And so therefore, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, some people like to like figure out where the title sequence will go and like say like cut to title sequence or something. That's cool if you want to do it, but it's certainly not required. Also, fade in is not required. Uh, maybe they'll fade in. Most likely they won't fade in. Honestly, fade in is not the traditional way to start a movie <laughs> anymore. So you can forget fade in. Just start with what you want to start with. Hello and happy holidays to you, Donna. I hope all is well down under. Okay, let's talk about this thing. <laughs> this thing I'm going to be doing here. Um, it's going to be a new occasional live stream series, um, just like the old uh, screenwriting step-by-step, -step, except I'm not going to show you step-by-step -step because it's too many steps. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is just give you an occasional share my screen, look over my shoulder while I work on this novel that I've been working on since 1993. Um, but I am actually going to get it done now. This is this is the time. Um, so what I think it's is, is sort of like, first of all, a progress report, let you know what I'm finding easier and harder than I thought, but mainly uh, give you some, some peeks into the process, the mechanical way that I'm doing it. The, because I, I do think a lot of people have asked me about writing stories, fiction, ga video games, things that are not scripts. Um, and it's a legit question, and I happen to be interested in that question. So I am happy to show you how I am doing it and to show you the things that I've been teaching about screenwriting that I think carry over really well. Storytelling is storytelling. A lot of stuff uh, goes between different mediums, and a lot of creative process goes between different projects and mediums. So that's what I am going to be doing here. Hi, Lysanda. Nice to meet you. Hello, Ray. Um, yay, glad you think so. Um, so cool. Let's talk uh, talk about um, how I'm doing this, what I'm going to do here. Um, the first thing is I'm going to show you, just like with the last one, I tend to do the same process for any project, any creative project, which is I make a folder. <laughs> I make a folder, and in this folder I create several basic documents. Um, in this case, um, I, I am working, by the way, in a 
a screen uh, a writing software called Scrivener. Um, that is that is what I'm writing. It's it's not free, but it's not terribly expensive, and um, it's not. It, it takes a while to learn the the. It's it's sort of like getting behind the cockpit of a. 747 or something of a, of a giant jetliner because there are so many possible controls and options. Um, the thing about Scrivener that I got to say I think is pretty cool is it it plans it's it's built for people creating long documents, um, complicated documents. Um, those could be books, they could be scripts, whatever it is, um, and they really have tried to make it as viewable in as many ways as possible. Um, and so what you need to do is learn which parts of it you want and which parts of it you don't, which really goes along with my basic foundational teaching question or, or issue, which is everyone has to do everything their own way. You have to figure out what works for you. The cool thing for me about Scrivener, and I am not being paid, but <laughs> they don't even know I'm doing this, but, um, but I will say the cool thing about it is if you take the time to learn all its possibilities, and the manual is actually great, the manual is very helpful, um, you can customize it to what you want, which is what I have done. Um, hi, C.G. Fernandez. Very good to see you. Thank you so much for showing up. Hi, Charlie. Um, I'm really glad. Oh, I'm so glad. That is that is so nice. I'm, I'm really, really grateful. I hope that, that these live streams are useful to you, um, but certainly thank you for showing up and, and, and saying that. That's really nice. Um, hi, Blaine. Good to, to good to have you here. So um, what I've done is I've created one document, which I've called NEM. NEM stands for Now Every Moment. Now Every Moment is the title of the book. Um, it has several different meanings, um, and I'll talk about how I came up with the title. I'll talk about it now. Um, the basic thing I wanted to... The title I wanted to be something that would kind of be mysterious and hooky. Like, you'd be like, what does that mean? Um, but at the same time, it would give a certain sense of urgency, which is which is part of what these characters are feeling, um, and also looking back upon life, trying to understand life, because that is a lot of what's going on in the story. Um, so the the, the the story is set among the uh, the uh, painters in the New York in the 1930s who will become in the late 1940s the abstract expressionists uh, Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, de Kooning, Klein. Uh, there was there was a, still there were a bunch of of painters who created a new kind of abstract art. Uh, it was unique. It it sort of changed the world. Um, and those painters, 10 years before that, were struggling painters uh, in New York during the Depression. Um, so that's the, the place where the story is set and the world that it's set in. Um, so what, what happened was I, I did this uh, document. Now, I'm just going to show you what it looks like here. Um, this, is, this is the, the and this is not the most, um, no, I'm going to, change this slightly, see if this helps. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, this document is is in this, um, there's like folders within folders in Scrivener. So what I did was I started to put in the outline in one folder and the text itself in a separate folder. Um, then, then I had research, uh, which they leave you a place. Of. My research got so big um, that I eventually just opened up a whole other document that was just research. Um, so that's what's going on here with this uh, separate uh, uh, now every moment and then now every moment research. And then there is an old folder I had, which is now every moment research, which is just a whole bunch of documents that I typed into and um, uh, then... Uh, things I grabbed off uh, articles over the years, over the decades. Um, if there was an article that seemed to have um, like new light, somebody wrote an article uh, or it's a book review about um, a different uh, view of these things, uh, the struggling artists, um, Soho. Oh yeah, the, there's a, there's some stuff that takes place in the 1990s and um, in, a, in art galleries in Soho. So anyway, that's what I did was I just threw all those in a folder. 
what I tried to do is get eventually, when I realized that I wanted to put the um, the research into um, this this form because it was just easier to work with for me, um, what I did was I copied a lot of these documents, the text of a lot of these documents into this. Um, what the way that this all was gathered was. Um, uh, let me let me go back to the the, the face. Here's the thing. 1993, um, a book had come out. Uh, I think I have a copy of it. Yeah. Uh, this book, Biography of Jackson Pollock. Oh, there we go. Um, Jackson Pollock, An American Life, American Saga. Um, it's, as you can see, <laughs> a really big book. Um, it was a massive, uh, best-selling biography. Uh, I don't remember why I said, yeah, I want to read it. 800 page 900 page biography of Jackson Pollock but it was something about the 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 fact that it was setting him in his culture in his world um anyway for whatever reason I started to read it and I ran into a, a chapter uh talking about what happened when the Works Progress Administration the WPA it was a government program uh from Roosevelt's New Deal in which uh the government decided that because of the crisis of the Depression, the government should put people to work. Instead of just giving them money, it's like, well, we need roads built and we need dams built and we need electrification brought to, to rural areas. Let's hire unemployed people to pay, work for the government to do government projects. But among those government projects, they also decided that art was a valuable American resource, and it needed to be supported by the government. This was mind-blowing at the time, still fairly controversial, but for a very brief pro um, period of time, sorry, the, um, the government paid artists to do art projects for public buildings, but also simply to do art. Um, they also went sent photographers around the country to take photographs of um, of America. They sent reporters to go uh, do journalism and, and um, interviews. They would interview. There, on, on the Library of Congress has this, or I think it's maybe the Smithsonian, thousands of interviews with all sorts of different people to say, what's your life like in 1934? What do you think about this and that? And, and it's, it's really an amazing uh, historical document. Anyway, the other thing that they did was they paid painters. For a very short period of just a few years, they said, if you are a painter, painting is a valuable thing. Let's give you, it was essentially about $100 a month, um, about $28 a week, which at that time was an extremely great salary. Um, and they said, if you do a painting, you know, two paintings a month or something, we will pay you. And you give us the paintings, we'll put them in galleries or in storage. Um, anyway... This was this changed American art because for the first time American art was a recognized as valuable because until then American art was not very considered serious. Um, and second of all, these artists didn't have to struggle and scrimp and save uh, to to get like an hour off to paint. They had they were paid to be painters, um, and it allowed them freedom and and uh, brought them to a new sense of self that ended up becoming. Uh, a new wave of American art. Anyway, the point about all this is that they described what it was like when the news went out that the government was giving painters money to paint. And it describes painters literally running down the streets of New York to find the other painters saying, you got to go line up at the office. They're giving away, they're giving money to painters. And I, the thing I thought of was, what if there's a guy who's not a painter, but He's seen abstract art, and he's like, uh, uh, the famous uh, criticism of abstract art is anyone can do that. My, my kid can paint a painting like that. He's like, if they'll give me money for one of these crappy paintings that anyone could do, so this, this drifter, this, this criminal, decides to try to get into that program um, to scam it. Um, that was where the idea came, um, the idea of a, of, a, of a criminal trying to scam the WPA. What this led to was the idea that having, uh, and I'll just tell you the whole story soon, um, he becomes involved with the painters and, and other people there, and it becomes, uh, uh, let, let me just tell you the story. 
There's a guy named Tom. Tom is a drifter and criminal in 1936. Um, he has grown up in an orphanage, ran away from the orphanage as a teenager, and has been a hobo and bum and, and thief for the past eight, nine years. He's now like 21, 22 years old. He's in New York City. He's basically starving. And he breaks into an apartment that has an open window because it's summer. And in this apartment, he sees a bunch of what are actually Cubist paintings, abstract art um, uh, that is... is a uh, he, he he steals whatever he can from the uh, the place, including the painting, uh, radio, stuff like that. Takes it to the pawn shop. The pawnbroker says, "Well, I'll give you a, you know a dollar fifty for the radio, but that painting isn't worth anything. But it's kind of worth something to the government because this this pawnbroker has a, a gripe against the fact that the government is giving money for for art." So he explains the WPA to this criminal. The criminal says, "Holy crap! I can take this painting and and get on this scam." So Tom goes to the WPA, lines up on the day that they're doing the, the, the um, sign up. He's got some paintings that he stole from this apartment. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but it seems worthwhile um, to, to, to do that. Anyway, um, he's there. He is rapidly realizing that he's in over his head, that he's not going to be able to pull off this scam. It has to be an ongoing scam. In fact, he'll have to keep doing new paintings because you got to keep doing that to get the money. Um, another artist sees him and gives him this funny look. He's like, I know, I know what you're doing. Tom panics and leaves. The other artist follows him. The other artist is named Charlie. Charlie is actually a brilliantly talented painter. Um, he's, he's the son of a, a famous Boston portraitist. He's a struggling uh, artist himself who's trying to find a new language for abstract art, um, which the abstract expressionists will eventually do, but at the time, no one's thought of this stuff. Charlie says, I recognize those paintings that you are trying to say are yours as this other guy who I know. He had his apartment broken into, um, and he says, this is a genius plan. Let me help you. Because Charlie um, is not eligible for the WPA for a couple of reasons. One, um, if you have family who can support you, you couldn't get on the program. Um, second of all, he doesn't want to do pretty art, acceptable art. He's, he's trying to find a new language for abstraction. Um, and, and that style of art was not very acceptable at the time. So Charlie says, hey, I need basically a front, a person who will show up who they don't know, who has no uh, income. And if you will take them, I'll paint paintings for you. You show up really saying they're yours. They will like them <clears throat> and um, we'll split the money. Okay. Um, Thank you, Doxy Loop. Although that's a scary name. Um, hello to Argentina, um, and I. Oh, I'm so glad they're helping with the graphic novel. I really do feel like like there's a lot of mixing and matching in in art forms. Um, so great, thank you. Hi, Doxy Loop, to you. Um, all right. So what uh, what Tom and Charlie do is Tom Tom is a little suspicious. Charlie seems like a nut job. He's a he's a down and out painter. He's 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 a Oh, a weirdo. Um, but so Tom um, watches Charlie, st stakes out Charlie's home, which is a loft apart, a loft in an industrial building. And um, he see Tom watches Charlie go home. And he sees in Charlie's that, that this beautiful, rich woman, this beautiful, rich woman named Billy, Wilhelmina, goes to t Charlie's apartment in the middle of the night. Now Charlie is interested. He's like, who's this woman? He basically falls in love with her. Um, it turns out that Charlie's girlfriend is a rich um, uptown, uh, the daughter of, of some people who own a big department store. Um, she's Jewish and she's uh, wealthy and she's in love with Charlie, but not at all interested in the art world. Um, Tom basically becomes... Um, Involved in the scam with Charlie, partly to to be uh, to get the money, but also because he's fallen in love with Billy and he wants to to be closer to her. 
So there's this love triangle, which Charlie is oblivious to. Billy recognizes right away what's going on. Um, Charlie and um, Tom do the scam. It works. Every week they, um, uh, they deliver some paintings. They get the cash. They split the cash. Um, and then things, things go, go badly from there. Um, anyway, so that's, that's enough of the story to get us started. Let me try and show you what I have been doing in terms of the writing part of this. Um, so here's the deal. This is how I worked it. Um, here over on the side, uh, these are notes to myself. Um, but, but this, in this format, uh, I've got different folders. This is just notes and plans. For instance, things that I tell myself to do, like um, the, the, the understanding of how abstract art was different and, and the, the process by which abstract art proceeded in the 20th century. And um, Tom, this entire novel um, is told by Tom. It's, it's an autobiography written by the character Tom the Thief um, in the form of four notebooks, or composition notebooks. If you're American, certainly you know that these these uh, bound black and white school notebooks um, that everyone has seen in America. Um, he has written his memoirs in these four notebooks. So, um, excellent question, Morbo. I will tell you, I originally started it as a script. In 1993, when I read that book and I got this idea, I thought, oh, this will be a beautiful, this is a great romantic love story movie. And I um, started to uh, outline it as a, a movie. It felt too complicated and too detailed and too, frankly, interesting. The detail, the story, the details of the story and the stages of the story and the internalness of the story was all stuff that just didn't feel like I could do it justice in a movie. Um, also, my experience at working in the movie business as I went along, because I started this just when I was starting to make it in the movie business. And um, so I would work a little on this, put it aside for sometimes months or years at a time, come back to it. Um, in the course of that time, I learned quite bitterly and, and quickly how little control and power a screenwriter has in the movie business. And this story, I really loved this story, and I did not particularly want to give it over to people who were going to say, oh, why don't you take out that character, or why don't we just cut this entire sequence? Um, it just didn't feel right to, to do that. So I decided to write it as a novel. Um, the problem is I did not have any confidence that I knew how to write it as a novel. So over the um, decades, I would put it away, like I said, for years at a time. A lot of the time simply because I didn't have time to write a novel. I had to make a living as a screenwriter. Um, but now and then I would say, I'm so frustrated as a screenwriter, I need to explore this story. Um, so what I did was, um, as you can see here, there's um, this uh, folder is for the outline. This outline is exactly how I would outline a script, but it's just a lot more scenes. So in this outline, uh, things are color coded to say basically how far along they are. Um, yellow is pretty far along. Um, the this sort of brownish orange is is not so far along, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so here's the deal: there are four notebooks as the structure of this story, um, four sections of Tom's memoir. Um, but in between each of those notebook sections, there's also a, a section just written by me, the author, to you, the reader, um, which describes five incidents. The first incident is this teenager um, in, in Gallup, New Mexico, um, finds he's, he's, he's a firebug, a kid who just likes to set fires um, uh, because he's got emotional issues and, and trouble at home. And um, it's it's a, a release of, of um, destructive energy to set fires. He's out in the woods and he sees this shack and he breaks into it to burn it down. And he sees that the entire thing, all the walls, everything inside are covered in, in painting. And they're all this sort of fantastical semi-abstract paintings. Um, and and the place has clearly been a... a an artist's studio um, for years, and now is abandoned. 
and he just can't burn it. <laughs> it's just too wild. It's just something, not something you never see. This place is, is a work of art, a work of outsider art. Um, so he leaves. Uh, then we read the first notebook, which is Char uh, Tom's memoir of, of meeting Charlie and getting into this, uh, involved in this love affair with uh, Billy. Then we stop in between the two notebooks. Um, there's uh, a description of a crew, a uh, construction crew, who are clearing the land to, to build uh, housing development. In, uh, and they're clearing the land where this shack was that the teenager found. Um, the, the crew finds this shack. They're like, what is this? This weird art, artwork place full of, of, of stuff apparently abandoned. Whoever lived there is gone. And um, they find this trunk full of personal belongings, including a lot of uh, rolled up old paintings and whatnot, but also these four notebooks. So one of the construction crew says, I'm going to take this. I bet this is worth something. Um, you know, you, you, you hear about like somebody finding a painting in their attic. It turns out to be a Rembrandt that it's worth a million dollars. He says, this may be worth something. He takes the trunk. And then um, the, we have the next notebook. And then the third section is about a, a gallery in New York. The gallery in New York is named for Billy, the character who's been in the notebooks. And it was this rich woman who uh, was in love with Charlie, but having an affair with Tom at some point, um, apparently in the 1940s started an art gallery for abstract art in New York City. It is now in the 1990s, a famous old gallery. The people who started it are long dead. However, this guy from New Mexico brings this trunk of paintings because he read the notebooks and said, oh, this person who started this gallery is in this notebook. Brings the trunk to the gallery and says, what's this worth? The guy who runs the gallery uh, could not care less about 40-year-old, 50-year-old um, unknown abstract artist uh, says, it's not worth anything. <laughs> so um, the the construction guy says, okay, I tell you what, I'm going to leave it with you. If you find it's worth something, split it with me. Um, the gallery owner says, sure. Uh, the gallery is actually going out of business soon anyway. The art world is changing. So the gallery owner just um, has it put in the basement. The, then another notebook. Then the next section is about an intern working at the gallery in the 1990s when the gallery is closing. And the intern is um, told to take to, to clear out the basement, which includes, they find, this trunk. Um, this intern is a, uh, an artist, um, a conceptual artist in the 1990s. Um, she's a woman. She's never doesn't really have that much appreciation for this kind of old abstract art. Um, and is, is very much a, another perspective. The gallery owner, each person has a different perspective on the art. Um, and the uh, intern looks at the art, it's like, that's sort of interesting, and then basically puts it on the truck to be taken to the dump. So whatever was in this, including these four notebooks and the paintings, is getting thrown into the dump. Um, then we have the last notebook, and then finally the last section of the book is a nurse at a nursing home in New Mexico uh, in the late 1990s. Um, she has had a patient who just died. Um, the patient was an old guy, um, had had some strokes, was not able to speak, but he did love to paint as badly as possible. But we, we don't know who this guy is. He's, uh, we assume it's Charlie, the painter from the rest of the story. Um, but the point is he has died um, and the nurse brings home one of his paintings, um, which she just found emotionally powerful. Um, and so she keeps the painting. Um, and that's the end of the story. Um, the, the, the story within this is that Tom, um, Tom and, and Charlie um, do this scam for the WPA, which allows Charlie for the first time to, to have freedom to do his art. He, Charlie cannot figure out what the exact kind of abstract art he wants. He wants to break through to a new type of art. He can't quite figure it out. Um, he's, he's kind of fallen apart. In the meantime, Tom and Billy are sort of circling each other. And at the end of the first notebook, 
um, uh, they end up um, making love on New Year's Eve at a, after a New Year's Eve party. Tom and Billy make love. The next notebook starts the next um, uh, the next morning, New Year's Day, 1937. Um, Tom goes to Billy and says, like, oh, my God, we made love. It was beautiful. It was great. She says, it can never happen again. Um, I am in love with Charlie. It was a mistake. I, I was just upset because Charlie has been such a mess. And I know you love me. And, and but this is not I, I truly love Charlie. And Billy and Tom realizes she's serious. She truly, truly loves Charlie and not him. And, and it, it, it upsets him, but he recognizes for the first time what true love is, which is not what Billy has for him. It's what Billy has for Charlie. However, what happens is Billy, provoked by what's happened, goes to Charlie and says, why don't we get married? Charlie has resisted being close to, to Billy, partly because he doesn't want to be a kept man. She's rich. He's poor. He wants to make something of himself as an artist before he can feel like he is not just a, a pet, a, a, a hanger on of, of a rich girl. Billy says, I know how you feel about that. I don't care. I love you. I want you to marry me. I'll support you. Charlie says, no. Billy leaves. Billy leaves town, leaves, goes away. Um, and so Charlie and Tom end up together without Billy in New York City for a year. Billy has disappeared, will not answer any things. She's actually traveled um, out of the country. Um, Charlie, left alone, recognizing that he has screwed up his life, um, devotes himself to his art even more and does make a breakthrough. He, um, he figures out, essentially, 10 years ahead of everybody else, the principles of abstract expressionism, the art. In fact, he he kind of experiments in most of the abstract expressionist styles that will um, develop in the 1940s and 50s. Um, each of the abstract expressionist artists, the whole point of abstract expressionism is partly it's unique and individual. So every st person's style is radically different. A Mark Rothko and a, um, a Jackson Pollock, you, they don't look anything alike. Um, but they all are following the same principles. Um, anyway, so basically what Charlie does is Charlie invents abstract expressionism, but he can't quite figure out which kind he feels the most. But he's so talented, he can do all of them. But no one ever sees this work except Tom and Billy, because um, Tom and Charlie become closer friends um, during this course, where Charlie actually absolutely becomes overjoyed. He's done it. He's figured out he can't quite decide on which style, but Tom sees the work. And Tom, remember, is writing this, these notebooks decades later. So Tom says, no one will believe this, but this guy painted like a Jackson Pollock before a Jackson Pollock. He painted like a Mark Rothko, but he never stuck to one style and he never showed anyone. No one saw this except me and Billy. Um, so Charlie's basically this undiscovered genius. Um, what happens is Charlie is so excited about this, he won't do any more paintings except this kind of painting. So he won't paint for Tom to do the WPA scam anymore. The WPA scam falls apart. Um, they, they, start, they get thrown out of the WPA. They're, they don't have that income anymore. Charlie doesn't care. He's so excited about this art he's doing. Tom first of all, is broke now. Um, and Tom sends a message to Billy through some mutual friends. He's, he, he reaches out in many ways. Like somebody who knows where Billy is, tell her Charlie's losing it. Because Tom has seen this art, which 10 years before abstract expressionism, he's thinking, this is insane. It's garbage. You know, if, if somebody showed you a Jackson Pollock in 1938, you'd be like, this is just a mess. Um, and Tom also isn't an artist. He doesn't understand what he's looking at. So in notebook number three, Billy comes back. She has been away. She's actually been in, in London um, in psychotherapy, trying to figure out why she's been in love with this guy. <laughs> the thing she realizes is it's love. She's in love. The, the psychiatrist says, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just in love with somebody who's wrapped up in his art. Um, 
Billy comes back and says to Tom, I'm back. Can you handle that? I, can you, I would like your help working to help Charlie, but I know that you're in love with me. Can you deal with this? And Tom says, yes. Tom says, I will help you. Billy tries to help Charlie. Um, Billy uh, tries to set up a gallery. She says, I will, set, I will open a gallery for abstract art so your art will have a place to go. Charlie says, I won't accept it. I won't put my art there. I don't want to be seen as being supported by this rich woman. Even, you know, even if we're truly in love, and I know that you may mean it, it doesn't matter. I will, I will not be able to stand being seen as a, um, a, a pet of a, of a, 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 a hobby of a, of a rich woman. Um, Uh, actually, describing the paintings is one of the reasons I wanted to to write it as a novel, because in order to explain the ideas behind the paintings, that wouldn't be possible in a um, in a, a, a film script. Um, it's easy to describe. I mean, you just describe me. You describe the just as you would if you were writing about the actual abstract expressionists, which many people have done. Um, so, um, and also, um, as I said in this note early on. Um, Tom can refer to the ex actual artist. He can say he the Charlie was doing color field painting, um, which Mark Mark Rothko would eventually be doing, but he was doing it ten years before. Um, so I can name, I can say it looks like this, but I can also describe it anyway. Um, exactly one word after another. Indeed, thank you for Agwagon. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Uh, Charlie may be noble, Fragwagon. Um, that's absolutely true. Um, but there's a part of it like, why is he turning this down? What a what an what an artist. Um, <laughs> uh, I've read interviews. I haven't interviewed any of them. Well, I think they're all dead. But um, but I have indeed. Yes. Yeah. No. Uh, abstract artists are fascinating. Thank you, Vicky Fox. I am I am hoping that this will eventually be readable for all of you. Um, so the final, the, the last, the rest of the story is Billy tries to, uh, offers to set up the, gar the gallery. Charlie won't do it. So Billy says to Tom, we need to do something to help Charlie that he won't know it's coming from me. So they set up a, a, a basically another scam, um, which is that Billy arranges with an art gallery owner to buy Tom's paintings, the ones that Tom did for the WPA. Tom, of course, didn't do the paintings. Charlie did. But the point is, they're good paintings. Charlie was a brilliant painter. So therefore, Billy says, I'm going to get this guy. I'm going to give this guy money. I'm going to buy these paintings through him, through you. Charlie will not know it was me. So it will just seem like his paintings were selling. The money goes to him. The pr and this works. Um, the part of the problem, though, is when Ch Tom starts to sell Charlie's paintings for the WPA, which are in a totally different style. Charlie, for the WPA, painted in a very acceptable um, social realist uh, uh, American uh, scene painting. There's a, there's a whole style of 1930s painting in which painters painted uh, the world as we know it, the Americans. Um, anyway, so the point is Charlie is devastated by this. Charlie is destroyed, not knowing that Billy's behind it, but simply he's destroyed that these paintings that he did essentially as a, as a scam are being bought for a good amount of money when his art is not acceptable. And it, Charlie stops painting altogether. So this plan that Billy has worked out with Tom to, to help Charlie actually destroys Charlie's will it's like he's like I give up. I'm I'm I can't do it. I can't break through the system of of the art world. No one will understand what I'm doing. Um, and Charlie therefore gives up on art and says he'll marry Billy. So now Billy has got what she wanted, which is she's marrying Charlie. But Charlie's broken, um, and Tom, who was trying to help Billy and Charlie has helped them be destroyed. And in fact, um, in the misery of this, Charlie is, is even more inaccessible and Billy and Tom become lovers again. Although it's a bittersweet 
love affair because both of them know it's not really love. Well, they know that Tom loves her, but Billy doesn't love him. But they take comfort in each other during Notebook 3. Um, in Notebook 4, Charlie agrees to marry Billy and, um, and they go away. They, they go off on their honeymoon. Um, and when they do, Tom, who has been living this, this alternate life, you know, he was a hobo and a criminal, a thief, um, until he met these people. And he's spent the past three or four years in this fascinating um, community and, and life. He's had this whole life. Now he has to go back out to drifting. He, has, he, doesn't, he tries to go back to being a criminal, fails terribly. He tries to rob a guy coming out of a bar. He gets stabbed. He ends up in the hospital for months. By the time he gets back to New York, Charlie and Billy have gone away on their honeymoon. But there's a message for Tom which is that Billy has left a bank account for him that he can live for the rest of his life uh, getting monthly payments from this, uh, this lawyer. Um, Tom doesn't uh, accept it. And they say, well, the money's going into the bank. You know, take it or not. Um, Billy wants you to have it. Um, I, I see your questions, by the way, folks. I'm going to answer them real soon. Um, so... What happens is Tom ends up living in Hoboken, which is right across the, the river from New York City. You can see New York from Hoboken, but you're safely out of it. So Tom can live there, sort of go into the city now and then anonymously, um, but he's, he's out of that world that he was in, that downtown uh, New York art community, but he can't really leave. Um, and so he ends up getting a job in, in Hoboken and, and um, living there, and he starts painting. <laughs> and he starts painting Billy. He starts painting the like he, he's finding his own um, amateurish but but personal outsider art. Um, and basically, um, so he, he lives there until um, Charlie vanishes. Charlie has been unhappy in his marriage. The war starts. Char Second World War. <laughs> Charlie vanishes. Tom ends up going uh, to see Billy. Turns out that um, basically what happens is Billy and, and, and Tom get together. Charlie has, has left because of his unhappiness. Um, it turns out that uh, Charlie has gone to volunteer in the army. And um, uh, a couple years pass. Tom is living with Billy, I think, I think he's with us, but I can't remember. Um, and somebody tells him Charlie's back in New York. Charlie is uh, operating a newsstand, Times Square, like a newspaper stand where they sell newspapers. I don't know if you guys know what that is anymore, but they used to have these little booths on the corner where you'd get the newspapers and magazines and shoe shines and, and candy bars. Um, Charlie is blind. He was blinded in the war in battle. Um, and Tom uh, get reconnects with Charlie. Charlie has um, basically Charlie ran away um, from the from his misery in, in the marriage. Um, and he um, he doesn't want to be a burden. And so he's he's living um, as a blind news dealer. Tom reunites Billy and Charlie goes off on his own, takes the money that Billy gave him and wanders for the rest of his life, um, living his life and, and painting. And that shack that we found in the, in the other stories, that was Tom's shack. Tom has lived the rest of his life as an artist, um, inspired and um, consumed by what uh, he, he discovered in life with Charlie and Billy. Um, that's the end of the story. So, so that's the that's the story. It's very, as I said, it's very very complicated. This is why uh, it wasn't a good it wasn't a good screenplay. Um, okay, so let me let me quickly get some answers here. Okay, first of all, Kay, thank you. Uh, really glad you liked the story. Um, hello, Camilo. Um, okay. Uh, yes, I am actually writing it. I've actually written. I, I'm glad that you're recovering. Good. Good. Key. Stay, get rest, and, and drink fluids. Um, I'm curious. Did you come up with the whole notebook story before the framing parts? Um, ah, great question. Here's how I came up to that. 
originally, when I thought of this, it was going to be a screenplay. And what it was going to be was um, a, a story that was told by an old man um, to a young couple. Um, that they're, 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 this couple's out on the road. It's the 1960s. They're hitchhiking. They run into this old guy uh, on the road, and he tells them his story of, of who he is. Uh, well, he tells them a story about, about young love, and it turns out at the very end that it's him. Um, he's Tom. Um, when I um, decided to change it from a screenplay to a novel, I realized that the thing about a screenplay is you need you can't have somebody writing their story, and you can, but um, it, it, the idea of somebody telling their story is a very powerful device in screenplays. Um, the, the movie Amadeus, uh, the movie Life of Pi, these are beautifully done, I will tell you my life story movies. Um, very powerful, really love those two movies. Anyway, um, I, just, I realized that if I were to do it as a novel, it could be a memoir, it could be a, a, a an unpublished memoir. And then um, then the breaking it into four books and making them notebooks came along as I was working on it because I wanted sections. I, I knew that it had to be broken into sections. Once I thought of the sections, I thought, well, how would he write this? You know, he could have typed it or something. But the idea of writing them in physical notebooks, that they were limited, that they were forced to break it into pieces and so you're telling a long story, it seemed like a great way to play with the uh, reader's expectations. Because one of the cool things you can do with the structure of a novel is um, you can change points of view. Um, it's very hard to do that on the screen. You can do it. Um, but in a, a novel, it's the easiest thing in the world, and it's a great thing to play with. So what I wanted to play with was these shifting points of view around this mysterious figure who was living in this shack. Um, so that's how I came up with the idea of the of the notebook thing, um, which gets into a, like a, an interesting concept, which is the question of of um, how you structure a novel or how you someone's walking their dog, um, how you build uh, and 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 create a novel. Because like I said, for one of the reasons that this took me so long is that I did not have confidence that I knew how to write a novel, even though I could write a novel. Um, I had actually written one many years ago, but I just felt like, what's the right way to do it? What I have realized recently, especially in this teaching, or the screenwriting teaching, you can do whatever you want, especially in novels. Uh, in screenplays, less so because the business is so narrow in its expectations. The art form is actually big in the screen, but the business is narrow. But in novels, seriously, uh, partly because the history of novels is so long, and so broad, people have experimented in all kinds of ways, and it's and discovered all possible, all sorts of possible methods for making a novel, um, including uh, uh, novels in the form of letters, novels in the forms of memories, uh, or or just straightforward storytelling. They're all possible, um, and there is not a right way to do it. Um, and and once that came to me, I was like, the cool thing about writing fiction is. You can you could break it into 160 parts. You could tell it in one sentence. I mean, the, you know, this, whatever you want to do, it's a legitimate form. Um, so that's that's what was I was operating with um, when I uh, when I realized I, I was basically allowed to write this. Um, is the story first person? Ah, this is a great question. The notebooks are first person because it is uh, Tom's handwritten memories. And he writes, I was. Um, in fact, here I can show you. I have, at a certain point, I took several months and I wrote um, a rough draft of what I could. So um, this is, like, I have I have about 50 or 60 pages of, of the text. Um, so it, it starts out, I've always been a thief. Um, and it's, it's Tom's, um, Tom's memories. Tom's writing his life story. Um, however, the um, the interchapters I'm calling them, the the things that are between the notebooks are third person and written in a very different voice. Um, so this I'm still sort of sketching in. Uh, I put them in italics so it's very very clearly a different thing. Um, so that's how I uh, and and the thing about the uh, 
these interchapters is they can be much more poetic. Um, and that's one of the things I wanted to do um, was, was have different languages, different voices. Um, okay. Finish all the... Yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, the thing about it is is it's not just about the money. It's about the relationship, the, 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 the dependence, the, the lack of equality, the dependence. It's, it's very hard to be dependent. Um, some people, you need to be dependent. You need to accept your dependence. It's not bad, but it, 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 it exacts a toll on a relationship. Um, <laughs> good fragment, yes. Um, is it possible to adapt the tele television miniseries into a novel? Yes, um, or reverse. It is possible to adapt a novel into a, 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 um, a miniseries. And one of the things I kind of, I wouldn't mind if when this novel is done, some production company sees it and says, oh, this would make a great novel, a great miniseries. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, one of the things is that that while you can do anything in a novel, you do want to structure it. Um, and, and one of the things I decided to do was I wanted there to be a sense of a mystery and a, 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 a thing that we think we know. So we find this, the, the point about the, the um, story is uh, the structure of the story is by opening it with this kid discovering this mysterious place. You're raising a question. Who lived in this place? Why did they do this thing? Imagine this this little shack in the woods and every inch of it, every part of the walls, the ceiling is painted um, with with abstract art images of of um, of this beautiful woman and the, the New York City and all this sort of like abstracted um, imagery of Tom's life. Um, but we don't know it's Tom's life yet, but we know it's somebody. We know it means something to somebody. Um, and so that um, essentially sets the hook. It says, this is something you're going to want to understand later, but we're not going to explain it yet. And so all during the story, uh, the notebooks, the memoir, you are noticing clues, like once you meet these characters and they get into painting, which is very good in the first 10, 15 pages, um, that Char Tom gets into the world of painters, you realize, ah, Somebody in this story is a painter and it's going to be their shack. But what I tried to do is make sure that there's hints, um, and, I, and I say this here in the outline, um, the, what I want to do is fake you out. I want you to think that Charlie, having failed to, to become the great painter he could have been and having um, been unhappy in his marriage and he leaves his marriage, up until the fourth notebook, I want you to think, oh, he ran away and lived in a shack and painted on the walls. Um, then what's going to happen is at the end when you realize, oh, my God, it wasn't Char Charlie. Tom got Charlie and, and Billy back together, older and wiser, and it was Tom. Um, the last sentence of the, of the book um, is, have I written it yet? I think I have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, be careful what you take from people in this world. It might never let you go. That's going to be the last sentences of the notebook. Um, the idea that it starts with Tom saying he's always been a thief. And what he stole in the course of this story um, took him over, which is he stole this love of painting, he thought. <laughs> he thought he was stealing love. He thought he was stealing um, the art. What ended, ended up happening is he became an artist. Um, and, and that's the, the secret structure of the story. Um, so I wanted to build it structurally, just like I would tell you in a, in, in a screenwriting story. Think about where is it going to end? What is the end of the story? The end of the story is going to be that Tom had this intense love and education, emotional and moral and aesthetic education with this love affair that went badly. Um, and it changed him for the rest of his life and gave him a purpose, gave him a, 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 a powerful driving force in his life. Um, okay, so um, thank you. I am very glad. 
Ah, so to write about another time, do you research that period? For example, customs, ways. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about research. Um, let me see. Do I have the research here? Did I, oh, I closed it. Okay. Um, here we go. So research, yes. Over the course of time, as I was doing this, um, I began to research. Um, uh, t just stuff about the history of art, um, the WPA. Um, I would there. There are many books about this, many uh, uh, memoirs, um, and so I just started reading them, <laughs> taking them out of the library. Um, and when I found something that I thought was valuable, um, I typed it out. I typed it. This was back in the 1990s and early 2000s, and uh, there wasn't scanning. So, like, this is a. Uh, um, a memoir by a, a painter who was in the WPA. Um, I typed out a lot of, of information. I typed out information from um, uh, histories of the WPA. So I have hundreds of pages of stuff typed out. Um, these are just facts about how the WPA um, worked. I just type it all out. Um, then there's then I type stuff about uh, the painting, the, the history of the painting, the, the theory of the painting. Um, and so what I've done is, yes, I've gathered this research. The important thing that I've had to now learn is it is it is very valuable to do it. There's no point in just learning all of this history without an organizing principle. I believe that it is most useful to uh, research along with writing the story. Because until you know what the story is, you don't know how you could use this research. Um, that's my only way, because it's, for me, it was just too easy to get into this research and spend, I mean, this took, you know, it takes months and months to do this, um, not full time, but, but I would read these books, type out these quotes, um, trying to just get, get the stuff into my head and onto, into a place where I could find it. Um, but until I knew, where was I going to use it in the story? Well, there's going to be arguments among different painters that Tom knows in this community who take different stands on what abstract painting should be. Also, Charlie, in trying to explain what he is trying to do, will essentially um, speak the voice of abstract expressionism. And so when he's trying to explain why his painting is not working for him yet, um, he will talk about the ambitions that the painting will have. I needed to research what was it they were trying to do? What did they think they were doing? Um, so that's how I've been doing the research. Um, um, they were famous artists? Yes, all, the, all of these artists have books and books and books about them. Charlie doesn't, because Charlie never showed his work to anyone. He never felt it was finished enough. He never quite put together something that he wanted to say. And this is something I wanted to talk about. is just an artistic problem. It's one I've had myself. I know other people who have done it. I know some people who are very talented who never finish their work. And I wanted to make Charlie a romantic, beautiful version of that tragic thing. Charlie was a true, it is possible, I believe, one of the things that, that I wanted to talk about in this was the idea that you could be a great artist and be completely unrecognized. And I don't mean unrecognized like, oh, Van Gogh, and eventually they picked you up. I mean, there were, I guarantee you, there are artists out there who are immensely talented, who never were seen by anyone, who, for whatever reason, worked in a place or a time or were not able, for their own personal reasons, to get their work out there. But that does not mean they were not truly, truly great artists. Um, and I wanted to explore that concept. Um, yes, yes, Forrest Gump is, is a, great, um, <laughs> a great example of a told life story um, in, in screen structure. Um, no, no, it's fine. It's all good, Doxy Loop. Good. Um, that, that was completely a legitimate question. Um, yeah, you have to do research for, for historical um, anything, but you can't let the research take over. The, the research has to have a way to go into the story. Um, hi, Delise. Very nice to see you. Okay. 
Uh, moral of the story, when a patron offers to help an artist, accept it, unless you are an heir or millionaire, if you don't want your work to end up in the garbage dump decorating a shack. Partly, um, partly yes, Charlie should have accepted the, the, um, the support. Um, but there is a long history of, of artists' discomfort with support. Um, uh, de the, the dependence um, that, and power dynamic of, of support of artists or patronage of artists is, is a long-standing real thing. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so it is both first person and third person in alternating sections. Um, aren't most novels first person? No, no, it's, I don't know statistically, but most novels, uh, I think actually most novels are third person. Um, have you ever thought about writing a novel set about Christmas time? Uh, no, I wrote a script about cr a Christmas script, but, um, but I haven't particularly, um, had a need to write a Christmas script. Um, Yeah. Yeah, the most third, first or third, second is very rare. Um, oh, first person novels, they're great. Great Gatsby is a first person novel. Um, six person, yes, the six questions um, are essential to encourage me in my work too. That's, that's what I want to do. What's interesting though is um, in the difference between a novel and a screenplay, the, the six questions are easier to keep track of in a screenplay, because there's just less that's happening. I mean, there are relatively few scenes in a screenplay compared to the novel. Um, yes, exactly. One last painting is hanging on somebody's wall. Um, cool. I'm so glad. Yes, transformation, the story of things happening and people changing. Um, I, I'm hoping next fall, uh, if if I keep working hard, um, I got to tell you that making the videos for, for the, the writing for screens is taken up a lot of time. So I have to, I have to decide how much research is appropriate. At what point do you say, I'm not ready to say, uh, I, I think this is a great question. I believe that you have to say, uh, I'm not writing my paper. I'm going to continue my story now every day <laughs> because it is way too easy to research for the rest of your life. Um, it is so much fun. Research is such a blast. Um, However, what I've one of the other things that kept me from writing this was I felt I haven't done enough research. I don't I don't know how to structure the re, putting the research into the story. One of the things about teaching you guys screenwriting was I had to say to myself, what would I say to someone who had that problem? <laughs> and the answer was, remember that the work you are doing in the research has to have a place in the novel or it's never going to exist for the reader. So therefore there's there is no, there is no use for it, and and you need to in order to not be Charlie, <laughs> you need to say I have to think about how uh, I have to make my story. Like what I've been doing lately is I spend most of my work time going through the outline. Uh, I'm going through the outline, um, and like some of the stories. Oh, that's, this is the text. Sorry, uh, I go through the outline. And um, I will say like, okay, here's just, this is what the scene's about. Um, these are, this is some notes, but the point is each, each scene I'm describing what happens. And uh, then I've got these notes to myself about what he's feeling. Um, so I, I am I'm working through the outline because some of these things in this um, uh, outline I've got a lot of questions. I, I, for those of you who know my outline system, if I have a question, if I have something I don't really know the answer to yet, I put it in pink. So we get some of these things where it's all pink. <laughs> I've got uh, a, a story here and like, I know that this is, needs to happen, but I don't know. I just don't know anything about this. Um, a lot of questions, a lot of questions. Um, anyway, so the point is, um, these are all... Um, the outline, I'm spending my time, I take on a certain scene and I just say, answer the damn questions. Try and work through why I, what I need to know about each thing. In the afternoon, when my brain is fried and I still want to do some work, but I can't look at the outline anymore, then I'll go through the research. And basically what I'm trying to do with the research now is just pick out useful bits, just phrases, words, ideas, and put them into a form where I can use them. And frankly, deleting 
a lot of, or throwing away a lot of the research, because the point of it is I need to get it down to bits and pieces that I can put. Like I'll say, this is a great description of where a painter's painting. What scenes can I use this in? Which is why I have to say, even though it's not a screenplay, this video, Think in Scenes, is coming up really, really, really handy for me, which is I've started to say to myself, like, uh, this research is so beautiful. I, I love to know about the, the lives of these different artists and the way the galleries worked and all this stuff. Where am I going to find the scenes? And, and now my outline is getting detailed enough that I can say, oh, it'll be in this scene, this scene, and this scene. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do with, with the, uh, the research and the um, how to stop researching. Do you think this story, historical fiction in general, gains or loses meaning and value as we get further from the time? Um, that's a great question. I would say um, the distance of time doesn't matter as long as the story can make it accessible to us. I believe that those that periods, distant periods of time do become less and less accessible. Kind of the point of historical fiction is to give us a way to connect with a time that is now inaccessible. So I don't believe that um, this story will be inaccessible to 21st century people, even though abstract art is no longer a controversial concept. But one of the coolest things, actually one of the things that Mad Men taught me a lot, the, the TV series Mad Men, the point about Mad Men was to say, it was not so long ago that marriages were uh, worked this way and it was completely acceptable to smoke <laughs> a cigarette all the time and that people were trying to figure out how to sell cigarettes and all these things that um, that in that historical period were were meaningful and to remind us that things have changed, that the things that are now accepted as true were not always accepted and what that did to everyone and what it reflects on for our life. Um, good historical fiction makes you reflect on, it, it informs you about the past and gives you an appreciation of the past, but it also reflects on the values that we now take as common because you recognize that they are they were not common then. Uh, yeah, to a certain extent, yes. Luckily, the period lingo is not terribly different. Um, that's interesting. Uh, research enough to, yeah, basically write until you need to know something. I found that it's still important. The, the question, I guess, is do you write? And for me, the important thing is I have to outline before I can write a scene. So therefore, outlining is really where the questions arise about how am I going to describe painting? How am I going to explain the difference between abstract painting and non-abstract painting and the different forms of abstract painting? Um, Yep, exactly. Very often you'll hit a specific question and you stop and research that. Um, that's that's great. Yeah, it's, it is awfully fun. Um, ah, well, you know, that's... <laughs> and once you get the answer to number six, once you know how the story ends, it will get better. Um, thank you. Yeah, I got to say, I am not unmindful that I have now gathered a, an audience of of, of uh, screenwriting students um, through YouTube that I will uh, definitely say, hey, I wrote a novel, you want to read it? Um, I don't know what came to mind. Horse's Mouth, yes. Um, interesting. Horse's Mouth is, yeah. Um, Horse's Mouth is a novel about a painter in, I think, Ireland um, or England um, back in the 1920s or 30s. Um, haven't read that in a long time, but uh, yes. Thank you, Vicky Fox. Um Yes, I hope so. I certainly hope so. Hello, Enco. Um, the name of this software is Scrivener. Let me let me see. Have I have I written that yet? Yes. Okay. Scrivener. That is the name of this software. Um, I do recommend it. I do warn you. It takes a long time to get familiar with it, and it's very complicated. Like I, like you have to customize it. Um, but but Scrivener is damn good for writing long, complicated documents. Um, thank you, Vicky. Um, cool, cool, cool. 
Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 pretty good. All right, all right. Um, flamethrowers, Rachel Kushner, yes. Um, yeah, and um, and Visitor of the Goon Squad. There's 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 a lot of good stuff about uh, writing, yes. Um, abstraction is an interweaving of thought, indeed. <laughs> um, abstraction is a is a wrestling with thought. Um, yes, I Mad Men was was really inspiring to me. Okay. Um, yes, still. Oh no, you guys. What? Mad Men is really good. Okay, so here's the deal, folks. Um, thank you so much for. I'm sorry that telling the story took a lot longer. That I, I will get more into the the process, which is really and the point of this is to not to tell you how great my story is. It's to show you the work process, which um, is the exact same process that I, I teach in, uh, and I, I really do urge you to go to my channel, um, and especially here, the first, these, these videos and the first three playlists where I try to explain uh, the basic principles by which I write in case they are useful to you. They're not the only way, they're not the best way, they're just some tricks, techniques, tools that I think are useful. Um, and I think that what's interesting is when you move from scripts to novels, in my case at least, you are finding yourself um, doing the same thing, but just it's like playing on a much bigger board, a much more complicated uh, thing, but it's the same thing. You're still working in scenes. You're still writing an outline. You're still structuring. You're still following a character through their story. All of those things are exactly alike. Um, okay, so yeah, all of you, thank you so much. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas to those who celebrate. Um, I will be here next week. Um, enjoy your holidays. Um, yeah, 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 definitely. The, um, thank you, Vicky. Um, I would definitely say uh, I did one uh, a bunch, but, but one um, about um, how to outline and why to outline and character arcs. I, there, there's some good stuff on there. Uh, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I, I look forward. To, I will I will do this every once in a while. Um, you know, not every week, but, but I will try and get into it. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you guys so much. Uh, and go write something.